Attending session three, hedgerows, windbreaks, and buffers, the functional trees on the farm. And our um, presenter today is Connor Stedman. And uh, Connor, I'm pleased to announce Connor, he's a ecological designer, farm business planner, and climate educator. He's based in Western Massachusetts and the Hudson Valley. As a lead designer at Appleseed Permaculture, Connor specializes in applying carbon farming practices to grow resilience and profitability in working landscapes. As an educator and facilitator, Connor works to help organizations and communities prepare for and adapt to climate change. He organized the internationally recognized carbon farming course and holds an MS in ecological planning from the University of Vermont. Welcome, Connor. Really, I am so thrilled and excited to uh, be have you here. So I'm really looking forward to um, hearing your presentation. The the big thing I wanted to to mention is that obviously we all live on native land, and um, to me it was all brought home even more so with the events on Wednesday with the white supremacists. Uh, taking over, uh, trying to take over Congress, that that there is still a lot of work to be done in our country, and it's it's involved with the food system, but it's also on all levels. So uh, keep that in mind as we as we farm and garden and do what we're doing, and try to to bring that into our awareness. Um, we also have many sponsors that have been really helpful in helping us. Uh, do the work that we do and also helping us do um, this work, the, this conference. So do, do shop from them and not that we're pushing a lot of consumerism, but far, as farmers, we do need a lot of these products. So let them know that, that NOFA is your, who, who's helped you uh, find them. Great, well, thanks so much, Sharon. Hello, everyone. Um, I've got slides and stuff, but I would love to just have a little sense of who is here circled up around this topic. So, you know, uh, no need to turn on your video if you don't want to, but I would love to uh, just get a sense in the chat of, of where you are and what, you know, what kind of farm are you working on or what kind of landscape are you working on? You know, some sense of why the heck you wanted to spend part of your Sunday afternoon thinking and thinking and talking and head scratching about trees on farms. Um, so if, if you could pop in your name and where you are and, and if there's just a very short little, I'm thinking like a couple of words about what kind of farm you're on if you are, that would be, that would be real helpful to orient me. We have Noah in Boston, farm in Waltham, farm that was previously a soccer field, wow. <laughs> Windy and vulnerable spot, hedgerows for habitat. Yes, okay. Green and greenfields pollinator project. Oh, very good. Yep. And then no farm yet, but in the plans. Excellent. And Sterling. And then um, market garden farm, two acre intensive planted, low to no till in Charlton. Home gardener living too close to 495. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's me with I 91. Um, cool. Okay. And then Swampskit with World Farmers, um, someone in Nantucket, a horticulturist, used to run an organic herb farm. Okay, great. Well, this is a good start and please keep putting those in the chat. Um, it really helps me know a little of who's here. Okay, yes, yeah, someone in Wellfleet, consists constantly experiencing 60 mile an hour winds. Yep, that would, that would make you think about trees. <laughs> um, and then an acre and a half in Central Max in Paxton. Um, Okay, good, good. So let me just speak to this windbreak thing here from Jess on Wellfleet. Um, this is not a workshop that's primarily focused on the kind of um, the detailed technical design characteristics of windbreaks, um, but we can answer some questions about that and go a little further than the go a little further than the slide. So good to know that that's your if that's your interest. Um, and um, okay, good. So so this is this is really helpful. Um, and yeah, as as Sharon said, um, I am a farm business planner. I am a designer, an environmental designer. Um, I work with individual farm businesses 
in the Northeast and I work with kind of larger projects around carbon sequestration and climate adaptation here and elsewhere. I do a lot of work with supply systems and supply chains. Um, and this question of um, this question of what should we be doing in the next decade, given the math and timeline around climate change? And, and how is that a really a unique answer for each person with how we're positioned? Um, so, you know, I, I want to dive into this topic of trees on farms, you know, for, for New England specifically um, a little bit. Um, so I'm going to attempt a screen share and we'll cross our, all of our fingers and toes and throw salt in the devil's eyes and everything else to see if it'll work. Um, and hopefully it will. Okay, how does that look as a starting point? It looks good, Connor. Okay, good start. Um, let's see. This is what didn't work before. Yes, I think we're in. Okay, very good. Um, so um, Sharon has said that she will do the kindness of watching the chat while we talk as I cannot see the chat from my presenter view. So please, if questions are appearing for you that you'd like to ask, don't hesitate to put them in the chat and, um, and I will address them as I can as I go and, and maybe at the end. Um, okay, so um, I wanna just start with grounding this conversation a little bit in um, some of the problems and challenges around a particular a particular view of agricultural practice that has had a lot of currency in the 20th and so far 21st century. Um, and that view of agricultural practice is actually one that is focused on the idea of best practices. So this is a, this is a paradigm of how we think about not just agriculture, but a lot of other parts of life. And it's a paradigm that has been really driving the questions around how to um, incentivize and support and research and finance and fund um, improvements in agricultural practice. It has, has been through this idea of best practices. Um, and, I, and what I just want to point to is that the idea of best practices has a particular lineage. It has a particular history and it has a particular history that comes from the design and management of factory floors. And that the idea that in a fabrication facility in a, in a factory, um, there is this huge premium placed on replicability and on the ability to run a mechanical process the exact same way every time repeatedly. And that the, and so the whole field of industrial design um, and, and the, the management of factory floors was really about the, the maximizing of production efficiency. And so it saw the human factory worker as essentially a component of the machine of the factory. So, so this, is a, this is a deeply mechanical, a deeply mechanistic world, worldview paradigm that gave a rise to this idea of best practices. And then it got adopted by many other industries. But one of the impacts of best practices is the idea of replication and the idea that the same things can be done in the same way in all situations. And you know, I think that one of the real gifts of living and farming and, and interacting with land in this part of the world is that the is that land here is so diverse from place to place. It's not that diverse in climate, but it's very diverse in topography. It's very diverse in soils. It's diverse in bedrock geologies. It's diverse in its history of usage by people. And so the idea of best practices really falls apart when we try to replicate what happens on one farm on another farm and expect it to have the same results. So um, that's why what I really want to work on and discuss with you all today is it starts not from here are a set of practices to employ on your farms, but it starts from here are some possible ways of thinking about trees on farms. Here are some here are some perhaps useful and illuminating ways we might think about trees on farms. And then what do those tell us about how the design and management of those trees might make the most sense in the unique situations that we find ourselves? And Sharon might be waving at me to indicate that there's a question here. Um, so let me know if that's true, Sharon. No, no question. Okay, waving at someone else, great. Um, so, 
so that's just a place I want to start is that I am not here in the business of telling you how to do anything. Um, but I do want to raise a set of questions and a set of a set of frames for how to think about how to think about trees on farms. So this is part of a larger um, endeavor and undertaking that NOFA Mass is engaging in this year around um, hedgerows, especially, and about hedgerows as a way to get more trees, more biomass, more biodiversity onto farms in Massachusetts. So there will be more events and programming related to hedgerows coming up in 2021. Um, but so I want to just locate this whole topic of these functional trees on farms within the topic of agroforestry and the global work of agroforestry um, and you know which is the integration of trees into with other kinds of agriculture um, kind of the full integration of trees into into farmland and and so you know I mean these are just some ideas about why people are interested in agroforestry what are the reasons why a farm business might move towards agroforestry you know it often starts from the idea of kind of developing the biology developing living soils living the living ecology of the farm and, and also through the um, really orienting around how to intensify farm production. And this is really significant in the global tropics where there are both um, a lot of smallholder farmers who are not just smallholder local retail market farmers, but they're often subsistence farmers. And that's a big thing that's changed in North America in the last hundred years, is that a hundred years ago and before, the you know, one way to think about this in kind of crude financial terms is that the price of food was high enough in relation to people's overall income and expenditures that it actually made a significant economic difference for people to be self-sufficient around food. Um, nowadays, the price, people spend, you know, usually less than 10% of their income on food and sometimes less than 5%. So it's, it's not very economically significant to be able to grow all your own food compared to what it was a century ago and more. Um, but in the global tropics, there is still a, you know, we're talking hundreds of millions of people who are smallholder farmers for whom subsistence growing is really significant part of their survival. And so it's in those situations where intensification of production on small areas of land is one of the most important things you can do. Um, and so trees play a huge role in the tropics and how to intensify small farms. In cold climates, they do as well, but it's a little different because we can't grow most of our staple crops on trees like you can in the humid tropics. So we have to have a whole different conversation about what's being intensified and we'll get into that. Um, but also people are often using just tools of diversification. How do we diversify in species? How do we diversify in height? How do we diversify in seasons and times of year? And how do we continue to move away from monocultures and still have the farm work? Um, and then this perennializing of the landscape, this perennializing of the, um, of the sort of cleaned up and simplified agricultural landscape. So these are some of the, I think, underlying motivations for why people might consider agroforestry. Um, and so, and I just wanna add a big one to that, which is that in humid climates, and I'm specifically saying that because in dry climates, there are some very big water and sometimes salination related limits on the ability to grow trees. But in humid climates, the, the real winds that are available around carbon sequestration on farmland come through trees. So the, the real gains in terms of carbon sequestered per acre, um, the systems that accomplish that to the greatest degree are all tree-based systems. And um, it's not the primary topic of what we're working on today, but it is a big thought that I want to um, ask you to consider, which is, that, which is that if what we're talking about with carbon farming is bio sequestration, then one of the biggest potential reservoirs of that is in woody biomass in, in, in humid climates. And so that then leads to the question of, okay, well, what is our starting point for that conversation here in New England? And our starting point looks a lot like this. So I spend a lot of time in my work looking at, looking at aerial maps, looking at satellite imagery. Um, and I, I love more than anything turning off all the extra layers of data. 
turning off the roads, turning off the places, turning off the topography, turning off soils, and just looking at the, the, the composite satellite imagery. Um, and so, you know, this is a very amazing view of this place that this larger place or part of it that NOFA Mass is situated in. And, um, and I think a lot gets revealed. So um, I want to just invite everyone to just look at this image for a second. And what do you notice in this image that might be relevant to the questions about what does agroforestry look like here in this part of the world? What do you notice looking at where we are? And Sharon, if anything pops up in the chat that people are responding to from that, maybe you can let me know. Have a look, think about what you notice that's relevant to this question of trees on farms and, and put it in the chat if you have a thought. All right, I'm actually figuring, I'm, I'm cheating. I'm looking at the chat myself. Um, all right, okay, someone says most of New England is wooded, right? We're very green, but pockets of gray brown signifying where there are less trees. Yup. Uh huh. Um, this is a forested part of the world. It really is. <laughs> right. So this is a big, yeah, this is a big, this is a big thing to think about here. And I, oh, I love that, Maureen, I love that someone said peninsula, right? So this is a very big, this is a very big thing to consider here. Um, if we were to zoom out from this image a little bit, it would become clear that this region, right? So, I mean, I mean, you, obviously you can't get a much more colonial name than New England. I mean, that literally is describing the process of colonialism. So, um, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of larger and older names for this place and they're still in people's, in, still in people's use. Um, but this Donland place, this, this Wabanakiak place is a peninsula. It's a giant peninsula that sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean. And it does not stop with the borders of the current United States, right? So if you've ever been up to New Brunswick in Canada, it's really clear that New Brunswick has a lot more in common with Maine than it necessarily, than Maine necessarily does with, you know, New Hampshire or Vermont. There's a continuousness of the landscape there. But this whole, this, this peninsula with the, with the St. Lawrence Seaway to the north and Long Island Sound to the south and then the Gulf of Maine to the east and the Canadian Maritimes. This is this larger geography that we're part of. Um, and, and it is a heavily, heavily forested region. So I just wanna point out a few things about that. There's a, there's a biogeography, now we're, you know, a lot of people I know are in Massachusetts. There's a biogeography just north of Massachusetts that is called the Acadian Forest Region. And the Acadian forest region, you could think of as, you know, essentially Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and the Canadian Maritimes. And, and that region is one of the least fragmented temperate for northern temperate forest regions in the world. Um, from the point of view of migratory birds, it's a globally significant migratory bird nesting region. Um, and it is, it is, it has some of the least forest fragmentation of forest at similar latitudes. Um, so as people said, this is a very forested region, but it is a very forested region again, because there was a period of about a century, a little under a century in the 19th century, where the large majority of this region was deforested. And that is very famously explained and explored in Tom Wessel's book, Reading the Forested Landscape, and a lot of histories of this region. So I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this. But this was the, this was the sheep farming era. And the sheep farming area is the era in which nearly all, not all, but nearly all of the stone walls of this region were built as paddock dividers. And that, that period of time, you know, there, there, was, there were places, you know, Vermont, parts of Western Central Mass, parts of New Hampshire, there are places that were over 90% deforested during that time. And, and that was not the first period of heavy deforestation. There were earlier ones in the 18th and even 17th century for particular, particular forest resources by, by the colonial process from Europe. So, um, so the forests that we have today, the, all this green that you're seeing in this image, these are post-disturbance forests. 
and they are highly altered post-disturbance forests because of that. They're altered in their species composition, they're altered in their age distribution. The silvicultural characteristics are wildly different than what they were previous to that. And previous to 1800, the, the forests of this region, they, had, they emphasized different species. If you, go, if you go far enough back to where there was kind of active significant land management by indigenous people, they included fire as a regular component of their of their ecosystem processes they had greater they had greater patchiness in their plant composition and age classes because of some of those disturbances in the western part of this region there were elk historically as a as a large herd migratory herbivore who created patchiness in the plant regeneration there was a uninterrupted presence of beavers with the wetlands and plant communities that they produce. So I just wanna put that image in your mind that, um, that these are, that this, both this extent of forest and these types of forests are a legacy of resource extraction. And, and someone's asking, how do we restore forest to pre-disturbance? Assuming we can, that's a big conversation and, and not mainly what we're, what we're honing in on today, but I will say that I think we need to assume that we cannot do that. Um, that climate change alone puts that out of reach. Um, and, but a lot of other things make that real challenging too. But thank you, thank you for that question. It's a really good question. And it, and it leads to other questions about, well, okay, what do we do instead? So, um, so, but this point about how forested this region is, if we're working on adding biomass, adding trees, adding biodiversity to farms, we're doing that in this patchy fragmented landscape that has regrown from these disturbances. And we're also doing it in a place that is mostly forested now to begin with. So I just want people to hold that in their mind because it is a different conversation here than in regions that are currently mostly deforested, such as, for instance, Ohio and Indiana, right? The, the eastern, the tall grass, the sort of um, oak savanna and, and further east portions of the Midwest. Um, it's a different conversation than in parts of California. Um, so we'll, we'll circle back to some of what that, some of what that might mean. I, now, so I wanna just introduce another frame for how to think about trees on farms. And that is how to think about trees in the context of a farm business. So I wanna pose a few more questions here and we're gonna go one by one. So have a think about this and write something in the chat if you got something. We're, gonna, we're, going, we're going to, we are deliberately going to pick up some of the tools and instruments of the, mechanic, the mechanistic worldview here, um, which, you know, totally flattens the existence of trees, animals, people as living things and as, you know, as, as individual living organisms with their own agency and their own unique selves, right? So that's, this is the impact of capitalism is reducing living things to numbers on sheets of paper. But that is what markets have requested and required of us as businesses. So in engaging with that world of markets, these questions are kind of confront us. And one of them is, what are trees on a balance sheet? So I want you to think about that for a second. What, on, on a farm balance sheet, what are trees? How would, you, how would you classify them, categorize them, and analyze them? Okay, they're an asset. Yep, yep, they are an asset class. Yes, I think that is a valuable way to think about it, right? Um, now that points out that we don't have very good mechanisms for valuing that asset in a lot of cases. And that's a really good point from Maureen. Often on a balance sheet, trees are non-productive land, right? They're actually a less productive asset than what some, other, what some other economic uses of that space could be. So that's another big thing we have to reckon with. What, here's another question. What are trees on a P&L? Uh, someone's asking, what is a P&L? Yes, profit and loss statement. Um, potential value of lumber. Okay, right. So there are some times where the harvest of the tree kind of removes the asset, but, and then converts it into cash, right? So, so indeed there is a stored value in some harvestable perennial plants, like, you know, like lumber, especially, but there are a few other examples. 
Um, and Amy says it depends. I think that's a really good that's a really good way to think about this. It depends on the trees, right? So there are some times where the trees are a expense on a PL because of the labor and materials involved in maintaining them. There are other times that they're a revenue source, right? Because they are actually they are actually producing cash sales directly from their products, like orchards, vineyards, you know, other other tree crop systems that you're harvesting from. So those so these are these are some ways that I think are helpful in diversifying this idea of what trees on farms are doing, and we'll get to that ecologically, but. You know, I'm including vineyards just because they're woody, they're woody crops and they are managed very similarly to trellised fruit trees. So, um, so sure. Um, and then, okay, what are trees on a long-term financial statement, on a long-term financial planning document or a financial model? Investments, says Amy. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll jump off of that one. So can give local tax benefits sometimes, yeah. <laughs> but in a long-term financial model, most, of, yeah, right. So, so most of the time, trees, I think, need to be thought of as a, as a capital asset improvement. They are, an in, they are a capital investment in improving the value of an asset base which is the land base. Now, depending on markets, they may or may not improve the property value, the, the, the market property value. Um, but this, and so this is, one, again, one of the big challenges with our economic system is that given that our economic system has decided that we transact in currency, it has not adequately valued the, the environmental work and services of a whole bunch of stuff, right? The value of, carbon sequestration, the value of the value of, uh, you know, the value of nutrient removal from overland runoff, the value of um, the clean water that is produced by that, the value of pollination services, the value of predation on agricultural pests, right? So we have a, we have a system of exchange that has no, it doesn't have the necessary equipment to actually track and quantify a lot of the stuff that's going on in the exchange. That's a big problem. And it's not a problem that any individual farm can fix by themselves. So I'm not saying that to say that this is our job to fix, but we do have to reckon with it as we, as we think about our farm businesses as whole entities. There's a lot of stuff that's not on the balance sheet. And there's a lot of stuff that the markets are not capturing. So, um, but this is, I think this is a really helpful thing because for instance, it's very common in farm financial planning for the labor of the labor of developing asset improvements to not be tracked and not be valued. Right? It's considered, you know, it's considered, oh, just that's that's the that's my that's my own work. That's my labor. That's like the family work of the farm, but that's actually an investment in the development of the asset base. So whether you put a quantified number in that or not, trees are an asset investment. And that also then points to the fact that they are a asset investment that is difficult to justify if you don't have long enough tenure on that land that you'll actually, you or the land will actually receive and see the benefits of it, right? So a lot to think about here. So we're gonna learn a little bit from ecology in thinking about trees on farms. So who has heard of this before? R strategists and K strategists. This is an idea that was developed by E.O. Wilson, who is a very famous, very famous um, biogeographer and, um, and kind of biological theorist back in the 1950s and 60s. R strategists and K strategists. What is an R strategist? An R strategist is our sea turtles on the left here. So our strategists are organisms whose reproductive strategy is to produce a huge number of offspring and invest very little parental care in each one. And they have a high mortality rate at a young age, right? So again, with sea turtles, there is literally zero parental care after the eggs are laid. The parental care is in the site selection of the egg laying spot. And after that, they're on their own versus K strategists 
are organisms who invest considerable energy in the, in the care of a small number of offspring. And they have a very low mortality rate as a result. So humans are case strategists and whales are case strategists. And there's other examples. I wonder if we could let our person in from the waiting room here who's just popped in. Um, so this is really relevant for thinking about trees on farms because sometimes we imagine that all trees on farms are treated the same in terms of the, the type of investment that they are. And I wanna kind of point out that they're not. So, okay, so here's, here's a metaphor, right? So we have our R strategist, which is also called a type three, a type three selection strategy in ecology on the left, which is the mass forest, the mass reforestation planting of trees. And then we have our K strategist on the right, a very doted on fruit tree. <laughs> who has gotten pruning, has gotten fertilization, has pest management happening. You can even see they're training the branches apart. So it has, I mean, that's a lot of invested embodied energy in the, the shape and form and success of that one tree. There's a lot lost when that tree is destroyed by animals or by windstorm or anything else. So I think this is a very valuable way to think about how much we're investing and why in the trees we plant. So I wanna look at this R strategist topic a little bit more. So these, this is the type three selective strategy. This is a high reproduction rate and a low survival rate. There is almost no parental care generally provided to each individual offspring. The population of these species can radically fluctuate year over year, depending on changes in the environment, changes in carrying capacity. And these species are very well adapted to unstable environmental conditions. So I just want you to hold that in mind as we think about climate change and think about the circumstances that we're heading into. So here's another way to here's another way of thinking about, thinking about this. The, the, the type one strategist is the classic K strategist, people, whales, mountain lions, right? Small number of offspring, high amount of parental care, very low, very low mortality at young ages. The type three is the R strategist, the amphibians, insects, fish, huge amounts of offspring, very little parental care, low survival rate, but there's enough of them that the population, the population regrows itself year after year, hopefully. And then there's these type two strategists in the middle. And this is where most birds are found, as well as a lot of mammals, where there's a moderate amount of parental care given to a relatively small number of, of individuals, but they tend to reproduce every year and sometimes twice a year, like with rabbits. So rabbits and songbirds are kind of the classic textbook examples of this type two strategy. So what I did as a thought experiment is I said, okay, what if we lay out these strategies in terms of trees on farms? So you know, you, here's your mortality rate, here's your animal species that we typically associate, and then here are what that looks like in terms of trees on farms. <clears throat> so I think our, our strategists are these mass reforestation and conservation plantings, where there's some very small amounts of work put into a huge number of trees. Um, and the point is coverage, the, the, there's not an expectation of there's not an expectation of everybody surviving. Um, and then on the other side, the case strategist, that's really clearly the orchards and vineyards. That's where we're putting a significant investment in each tree or vine because it is a commercial asset. Because it is actually, there's a, there's a cash production for the farm's balance sheet from that tree and that vine, right? And then in the middle, we've got these hedgerows, windbreaks, timber strips, silvopasture plantings, where it's somewhere in between. We're not just putting out thousands of seedlings and seeing how they do, but we're also not babying them in the way that we might our grafted fruit trees in, in, a, in a commercial orchard system. So, um, so this is a framework that I'm proposing here, is that, is that our tree plantings on farms fall somewhere in this spectrum. And it's very helpful to be clear about where they are and why and be able to justify that in the financial logic of your farm business. So I just wanna pause and see if there's any questions or comments on this before we go forward, because this is the basis for a lot of what we're gonna be talking about. Do you have an analysis of the types of plantings based on, yeah, maybe be able to function better with climate trends? Well, that's a, that's a big question. And in a lot of ways, that is another topic, but it's a question that it's in part about assisted migration, 
So, you know, assisted migration is the idea that basically it is the observation that the rate of the climate changing is changing faster than the dispersion rate of genetic material from plants and animals. So plants and animals are not able to move hardiness zones as quickly as the hardiness zones themselves are moving. And therefore humans might decide to assist in the migration of those species. And people are doing this a lot in the arid West, especially where you're getting kind of whole ecosystem change because of significant aridification in addition to just changes in temperature. Um, and that hasn't quite started to happen in the Northeast, but I think it's coming and I do, I do have some thoughts about that. So let's see if we can pick up that a little later on in the conversation. Any other questions or comments right now? What direction is that going in the Northeast? So, okay, basic climate, here's the, here are the basic climate change trends in the Northeast. And I think it's important to understand that the, the and I'll say the inland Northeast is maybe one of the, the single most sheltered regions in the entire world from the effects of climate change. In other words, you know, Definitely increased flooding is happening, temperature changes, season weirding, early, early thaws, late freezes, all that stuff is real. But the magnitude of it here is dwarfed by the magnitude of changes elsewhere. And that's very important for those of us who live here to think about, because it means that in, in, my, in my assessment, our day-to-day -day experience, our sensory information that we take in is giving us inaccurate information about climate change because we might imagine that, oh, this is what the whole world is experiencing and it's really not. It's a, it's a small fraction of what most of the world is experiencing. And that hopefully can be very humbling to us and also you know, give us the idea that our region is a kind, may end up being a kind of refuge for the movement of other species and the movement of humans, human communities, um, because we, we are being impacted so much less than so many other places. Um, but the broad trends are higher temperatures, more precipitation, and that's really interesting because most of the world is getting less, but also more of that precipitation is falling in large storm events because we're also getting an increase in tropical storms and hurricanes in the North Atlantic with the increase in ocean temperatures near the equator. So the, the incidence of both flooding and droughts are increasing. Um, and, and then we're getting the changes in phenology and the changes in seasonality, you know, with late with, you know, first and last frost dates expanding and, and changing, we're having an increased incidence in, you know, early thaws followed by late freezes that can that can wreck fruit crops and things like that. Um, so hopefully that answers a little of your question, Maureen, about the broad, some of the broad trends. Um, okay, so let's keep going here. Okay, I just want to again, can I want to connect these two ideas. So trees are, they have a life, they have a presence in our financial documents and, and, and our financial equations. And they also have a kind of story of energy expenditure and energy investment in that it mirrors the reproductive strategy found in nature. And I will point out too that almost all plants are our strategists in the wild large, large, large numbers of offspring, very little to zero parental care of those offspring, you know, and orders of magnitude levels of mortality, you know, from, you know, tens of thousands of seeds dispersed, thousands germinate, hundreds live to seedling and sapling stage, tens of them reach the overstory and you might get one who's the big ancient tree who's seeding so many generations after that, right? So we're talking about often, you know, it's often one in a thousand or less who actually become a canopy tree in a forest. So the more we go towards an R strategist, the more we're operating the way forests work. But our farm businesses don't work the way forests work because markets don't work the way forests work. So there's a there's a there's a really there's a real tension there, and I think that's why this this type two strategy, this kind of songbird and rabbit type strategy around how to protect trees is an interesting one. So. Um, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna skip this for a second and go to how to plant trees. We'll come back to the history in a sec. So, um, so how the heck do you plant trees? This is, you know, this is one of the challenges with agroforestry is that when we don't have a tree-based agriculture, this isn't part of, this isn't part of, 
you know, it's often not part of 4-H, it's not part of a lot of ag schools. Um, and so we, we especially see that in silvopasture where, um, you know, grazing and tree management are like two totally different fields. They don't even use the same words to talk about the same things, right? So, um, so here are some things to consider around planting trees and we're gonna keep going with the same chart, okay? So what I did here is just, some things to know about tree planting, protection, and care in each of these three types of strategies, right? And a little guess at the range of cost you might invest in each individual tree in each of these strategies. So I'm going to give people a second to look at this. Anne is asking if we have the slides. Absolutely. I don't know how to do it, but Sharon can help us out with that. Um, I'm always happy to have people email me if they want slides. That can be one way to do it. So have a look at this. What does this say to you in the context of the conversation we've been having? What are some of the implications of this spectrum of tree planting and protection and care and cost? What are the implications for how we might think about these trees financially? What are the implications for how we might think about the trees in the landscape? Okay, Amy says type one is the most expensive. Yeah, I wanna really point out this number down here, this 50 to $150 plus number. Cause you might think, gosh, that's really high, Connor. I look in the nursery catalogs and they're $25, $35 a tree for a grafted fruit tree. Um, but if you really think about if you really think about those trees as an asset class and as a capital investment, then what you're what what that means is that all of the animal protection, all of the fertility improvements, all of the pest and disease management, all of the care and vegetation management, weeding everything that goes into it in its pre-commercially productive lifespan, that is all part of the capital investment, right? So this is a, like a total capital investment number per tree and it's high. And, and so Maureen's saying, yeah, orchards and vineyards are more expensive and may not be able to survive climate change. So this is a really, this is a really big topic, right? And I'm glad you're saying, unfortunately, that's a big part of what we do on our farm. Yeah, orcharding is a huge industry, right? And and so, you know, in the Hudson Valley, and I just want to be clear, I'm not saying people should not be orchardists. I love, I love orcharding. I love fruit trees. I'm totally obsessed with it. Um, but I just, we need to really think about, we need to think about weather variability with these investments and whether we're making the right kinds of investments because of that. So for instance, in the Hudson Valley, where I do a lot of work in the last six years, there has only been a peach harvest three of those six years because of this climate change phenomenon of early freezes and early thaws and late freezes, which peaches and other stone fruits are especially vulnerable to, right? So yeah, you know, climate change is gonna bring new pests and diseases that'll affect, that'll affect our orchard plantings. We're already seeing that with the spotted wing drosophila and with the spotted lanternfly and everybody else. Um, type one is a bigger asset and might produce a higher return, right? The whole reason that it's worth investing 50 to $150 plus per tree is because they are cash commercial assets, right? Um, now there are some examples in this middle category where they're playing an economically measurable role and they don't require as much cost. Someone's asking about whether nut trees are more stable. Well, so we really only have one com commercializable nut currently in New England, and that's the Chinese, Chinese and Japanese chestnuts. Um, the, we do not have commercial genetics for hazelnuts currently. So the, um, and we don't have commercial genetics for English, English slash Carpathian slash Persian walnuts. So the, what, when we're talking about nuts com as commercial orchard trees, we're really talking about chestnuts. And, and the, you know, just to give you a sense of the total cost, I've done a lot of chestnut modeling, the total cost per tree as we're at measuring here is around $80 a tree for kind of the, the sort of um, seedling based, the seedling based orchard systems that we're using. Um, so uh, I don't know if they're more stable. They are, they require a lot less maintenance than, than commercial fruit plantings and they have a lot lower pest and disease challenges. Um, they also don't yield as much. They don't yield nearly as much per acre. So it is a different kind of financial model. It's a different kind of investment. 
Um, fruit tree varieties that have a greater chance of surviving climate change, yes, right? So your, your, your heirloom varieties that didn't have as much of their pest and disease resistance bred out of them is one of the places to look there. And your, and then the other place to look is just, is at the level of biodiversity, at the level of, you know, if your whole farm is a peach farm and you're only producing a yield every other year on average, that's a challenging position to be in. That's a monoculture position to be in economically. Um, people are asking about good risk management with climate change, striking a balance between types on a given farm. That's, I love what you're saying there, Christine. I think that's a really key idea that, that we're actually thinking about a farm as a unique entity and thinking out what balance of these different types of tree investments make sense for that farm situation. That is exactly the kind of tree planning process that I'm hoping to encourage people to go through. And I, what I want to just suggest is that it's not, the answer is not going to be the same for every farm. The answer is not going to be the same on every landscape. Um, there might not be any type three at all on a lot of farms. There might be places where there's huge benefit to nutrient re nutrient pollution reduction through riparian buffers, and that you can you know the, there's actually potentially public funding you can get for doing that through NRCS. Um, you know a lot of those NRCS conservation buffer practices are in this type three category. Um, Someone's asking about food forests, more diversity, more micro, you know, kind of sheltered microclimates. Um, you know, we have really good subsistence models for food forests. We have really good models for, you know, having food and nutrients year round from a small area of land. The commercialization of food forests, this is the big thing that I want people to imagine on this topic. And this is a, a conversation I have with people a lot. The commercialization of food forests does not look like what we think food forests look like. Because what we've become accustomed to with food forests is the highly diverse backyard forest garden, which is a mimic, it's a biomimic of the tropical home gardens. And that, the, the commercialization of that is going to have to integrate with mechanized, equi mechanized equipment management. And it's gonna have to integrate with grazing because those are the tools we have to manage grass and manage weeds and manage vegetation pressure on a commercial scale. So the, the, there, are, there are people who are experimenting with and exploring these questions of you know, fruit tree vegetable integration through alley cropping, um, of you know, nut tree and small fruit and grazing integration, um, like with the Big River Chestnuts project uh, that John and Niger is doing. Um, and, you know, where what what many of those experiments are showing is simplified polycultures, not the level of diversity that you're used to seeing, you know, in in the high biodiversity backyard food forests. That's not what they look like at a commercial scale. They look like they look like they look like agroforestry, but in rows and alleys and understory plantings that have a have a common pattern to them across a larger landscape. So um, I can talk about that a lot more with people if they're interested, um, because it's a, it's a big interest of mine. Um, but I will say that um, you, you have to think about how is this managed in a way that it is actually profitable. And the management and maintenance is the big challenge as you make food forests larger and larger in a way that you actually get a yield from them. Um, so I noticed the category identified as most resilient is the most affordable. Yes, well, Resilient on a certain time frame, that that third that third category. However, also you're planting thousands of trees in that category, so you have to do a real comparison. Like, it's not always actually it's not always more financially effective to be in type three compared to type two or type one, and that's why it's a it is a farm specific project to figure out what's my landscape situation, what's my business structure what is the value of these trees as assets to me? And then what am I gonna do with that? So I'm gonna keep moving here. Um, designing tree plantings. This is just a way to think about a planning process. It's not the only way, but there's goals to be really clear about. And I'm asterisking that and I'll talk about that in a little later. There's site analysis, there's understanding your, the, the characteristics of your land really well. There's design, there's thinking through what the options are and laying them out on paper and, and kind of changing them, making decisions about them. There's actually implementing it 
you know, putting the trees in the ground and caring for them. And then there's kind of evaluating and evolving from what you learn as you go, because, um, you know, what do they say that no plan survives contact with the enemy? Um, in other words, they, there, it is all the design always changes in contact with implementation. It always changes in contact with reality. It is a best guess. Now, the thing that's really important with trees is to ensure that your goals are actually achievable, right? Because sometimes, sometimes people's goals aren't, aren't actually possible to achieve in the, in the resource constraints that they're in or on the kind of land that they're on. Um, and, and so given that trees are, right, the thing about, the thing about annual gardening, you know, crop, you know, cropland management is that you can change what you're doing relatively quickly if you have the right equipment. And, and but with trees, you are losing an, you're losing a significant investment when you change what you're doing. So there's a higher burden of due diligence. There's a higher burden of kind of, um, tr you know, kind of, ground truthing, fact checking, making sure the concept makes sense before the investment. And I just want to be clear, I'm talking here about commercial situations, right? So I am totally, I'm totally in love with, you know, homestead land management at the level of, you know, the, the home orchard, the home, the home food forest for my friends and family. That's a beautiful thing. Um, and that, that has room for a lot of experimentation, a lot of kind of edge of the industry learning. Um, but as soon as you're trying to make a business case for something and you're actually putting, you know, even if you don't have investors, your own, even if you're not putting a lot of cash into it, your own sweat equity is an investment. And so we just want to be really, we just want to be really kind of well-informed about the kinds of investments we're making. Um, all right. So Maureen says we're growing apples, peaches, plums, pears, apricots, plum cots, figs, quince, cherries, along with vegetables, flowers, herbs on a small farm, would that be considered a food forest? Um, that sounds pretty diverse, right? And so usually with usually when people talk about food forests, they're talking about multi-strata systems where there's an integration of different kinds of production with each other. So for instance, there's interplanting where the, the herbaceous crops are interplanted with the trees. Um, for instance, there's a whole other non-permaculture school of fruit vegetable integration from Alan, this guy called named Alan Chadwick. So, so Alan Chadwick was a French agronomist who, in, who came and he was one of the founders of the, the farm and garden school at University of California, Santa Cruz in the 1960s. Um, and so he and his students are sort of, you know, they, they brought what's called biointensive growing from continental Europe to the US. And so the John Jevons book, you know, how to grow more vegetables you can possibly imagine, et cetera, et cetera, that really long title. That's from the Alan Chadwick bio, French biointensive lineage. And that is, a, that is a trees and vegetables interplanting approach also. So, um, so, so this is not just permaculture, it's not just tropics, it's not just um, what we think of as food forests. There's a lot of tradi traditions of that. Um, yeah, so I, Maureen, I think you are doing, you are, you are doing a, kind of, a kind of food forestry. And um, you know, often in those cases, you have some commercial trees and some non-commercial ones. And maybe you've figured out a business model where you can have high biodiversity within your trees, high species diversity within your trees. Um, the challenge with a lot of highly diversified orchard systems is that um, on a small scale, you are not achieving um, economies of scale to the point that your labor is well compensated. So, um, you know, especially with especially with um, a lot of these a lot of these fruit species, um, you know, I would just have to, you know, if we were working on it, I'd have to know a lot more about your markets to and and kind of look at your sales numbers, look at your financials to really kind of evaluate. Okay, what kind of work and role are all these different trees playing? But it does sound like you're doing a, a very diversified form of kind of um, kind of small fruit and vegetable growing. And that's really cool. That's, that's, that's really great. Um, so, um, okay, I think I'm gonna, I just wanna skip back to this history topic a second because, um, okay, this image is a really amazing one on the upper left. So, um, if, if any of you ended up listening to my pot and my NOFA mass podcast on hedgerows, um, I go into this a lot more in that interview, um, you know, about the relationship between hedgerows and empire. 
Um, and there is a significant there is a significant one across time. But this is an amazing piece of um, so these are called illuminated manuscripts from the so-called Middle Ages. Um, you know, this, these, these ages of encyclopedias, these ages of beautiful illustrated Bibles and encyclopedias and, and, and all kinds of amazing things from, from Europe. And, and in this one, if you look at what's happening in that picture, they're planting fruit trees and they're laying a hedge, right? So they're showing agricultural work on a tree, on a tree-based agriculture. And there's all kinds of amazing things like that that even survived into the early 20th century in Europe, just to use Europe as an example. There are, there are incredible horticultures of how to grow grapevines up fruit trees as their trellises. There are incredible horticultures of growing and producing tree hay. So woody fodder for animals that's grown pollarded at a certain height off of trees. And then the, the knots and techniques that are used to bundle them and carry them on your back. There's just amazing stuff like that. And, and, the, and so the really interesting thing I think that happened in Europe around trees on farms, it relates to it relates to the gradual and then accelerated enclosure of common land into private land. And so there's a lot written about this. You can see whole incredible maps of the specific enclosures that happened in Scotland and England and, and on the continent of common, commonly held land that then was, was enclosed with fencing and then taken into private, pr private ownership by specific landlords. And, and that, that enclosure process, um, it cut off access to the common forests and the common woodlots and the common orchards that a lot of that a lot of people had, and it was happening at the early development of kind of mercantile capitalism, and so you had the early development of a greater extent of kind of national and international export markets, and so export markets simplify landscapes. Export markets, export commodity markets radically simplify landscapes. And that's what happened here in New England in the sheep farming era. There was an international export market for merino wool. And we often think of commodity export farming as like the palm oil plantations in Indonesia that are destroying the orangutan habitat and the cacao plantations in Ghana and the Dominican Republic and everything like that. But that's what it was here. It, and and you had a single crop that everyone's livelihood was based on. And people had their subsistence gardens, they had their milk and butter cow, they had, they had the, the subsistence diversity, but they were very, very tethered to this merino wool market for multiple generations. And it resulted in a loss of multiple inches of topsoil from this region. It resulted in a near extinction event of wildlife in this region. In, by 1900, there was no there were no rattlesnakes, there were no snapping turtles, there were no turkeys, there were no, beavers were long gone, all the large predators were long gone. There were no deer in most of, in most of New England by 1900. There was little populations that survived and then re-spread through the region after the abandonment of those farms. Um, so, and then the regrowth of all that green that you saw in the photo. So, um, so this, this role, this long-term role of these diversified tree landscapes on farms has always been at odds with export commodities. And it's been at odds with kind of the economic imperatives of being in export markets. Um, now, in so, so these, those old forest and orchard and coppice lot belts that made their way through the countryside in a lot of Europe. They got shrunk and shrunk and shrunk by these enclosures. And then many of the remaining ones, especially in continental Europe, got cut down in the 1930s and 40s with the mechanization of agriculture. And so the, now that whole process never really happened in quite the same way in North America. And that's a whole other story to get into. But what I want to point to here in this bottom photo is the particular legacy of mass tree planting in the United States recently, right? Because remember, native agriculture all over North America historically, right? And then big impacts and changes to that from colonization, including land abandonment, including, um, including adoption of 
adoption of European farming in some cases, especially fruit trees, right? So there's an amazing, amazing history of, you know, especially in the Haudenosaunee lands in New York, there's an amazing history of kind of native adoption of orchard, of fruit orcharding with European species that added to the orcharding they were already doing with native North American species like the Allegheny plum and, and pawpaws and other things like that. So, but again, the, the export market simplifies. So when the Dust Bowl happened in the 1930s and, and 20, 20s and 30s, and then you had the jobs programs in the New Deal, there was the Civilian Conservation Corps that people I'm sure have heard of. And there was, a, there was over 2 billion trees planted in about a 10 year period by the CCC, mostly in the Midwest and the Plains and a little bit in the Intermountain West um, agricultural areas of the Rockies, but especially in the Midwest and the Plains. And these were, these were best practices type plantings. So these were a very small number of species that were planted in huge numbers in monocultures essentially as windbreaks and erosion buffers. And, and it was particularly around stopping soil erosion from wind. And, and it, was, it was successful but it, they were implemented in a way where the plantings were not designed to have a multifunctional role on the farm. They were designed for a single purpose, like a component in the factory floor. And then they were not adequately maintained. So that whole story of this monoculture tree planting approach is, we are in a moment where that is trying to be replicated by the effort to have mass tree plantings as a climate change solution. And that then is, you know, is essentially putting us in a position where we're putting a type two level investment of finances into tree planting, and we're gonna have a type three level mortality. Because when the trees aren't well site suited, when they're not adapted to their local environment, when they're not planted correctly, and when there's not the situationally specific thinking that living organisms and living systems require, then I think we're gonna have a lot of problems and we're already seeing that in the kind of very, very high failure rates of some of the mass, mass tree plantings that are being done for climate change right now in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and Mongolia and parts of Europe. So I just wanted to put the bug in your ear that this you know, plant a billion trees, plant a trillion trees for the climate, um, it really depends on how that's done and what the trees are and how they're, and how they're planted and then how they're maintained. Um, and so all of that requires you know, the kind of knowledge of this community to about how to do horticulture and agriculture really successfully in order to be successful. So keep your eyes out for, keep your eyes out on the tree planting campaigns and get in there and become leaders of them because we need a lot of local knowledge and how that then gets implemented. So um, let's zoom through some of this. Um, two questions to ask yourself around tree, around goals for tree planting. Um, what is the tree planting trying to do and how will you evaluate its effectiveness? Because this is, again, I can't tell you what the answer to that is gonna be. You have to think about that for your situation, but what are you trying to do and how will you know if it's successful? Um, there's some examples here, decreasing wind impacts on crops, decreasing erosion, decreasing nutrient runoff, improving habitats, maybe producing a cash crop. Um, and then what are the major restraints or considerations specific to your business that you'll need to focus on as you make your tree planting plan? For instance, what trees are available? Where is the money coming from? Kind of how does it fit within your overall farm finances? Um, right now, there's not very good sources of funding and financing for tree planting as an asset class. Um, so there's people working on that. There's efforts to create a Northeast tree planting fund to fill some of the gaps in NRCS funding. There is some NRCS funding for certain practices. Um, easier to get in some states than others, as we all know. Um, so some questions about site analysis. These, are, these should be familiar kind of dimensions of your landscape to you, but these are some of the things you need to think about. You need to think about where you are in terms of climate and hardiness zones and also frost free days and chill hours for certain species and, and you know, um, total, total heat during the growing season, growing degree days. Um, the type of soils you're on, there's some trees that are really intolerant of certain soils. There's other trees that do really well in a wide range of soils, but you have to know the tree to soil type match is one that is likely to make sense and work for, again, to kind of make good on the investment in the trees. 
the role of landform and topography, um, you know, the role of the role of water, not just in terms of the, the soil type, how much water sits on the land, but also is this a planting that's going to require irrigation at the time of planting or afterwards? And then how do you design and maintain that irrigation system? Um, is that an effective investment? Um, being able to access the trees, you know, not planting the trees so densely that there's needed access, it's not possible, um, is a big thing with windbreaks and a big thing with visual screens, for instance, for solar, for solar installations, is how do you actually maintain the planting such that it actually grows as intended. Um, the role of microclimates, the role of, you know, if you're trying to plant a windbreak, then the angles of wind exposure play a big role in how you lay out that windbreak and what the what the goals are, and then how it fits into your overall cropping system and cropping plan. Um, so, I want to show some applications of these kind of functional trees on farms, focusing on this type two, this middle path here um, of the kind of the rabbits and songbirds version, where there's it's not just a mass planting and leave them to the wolves, but it's, there's an investment in the survival of the trees, but it's also not necessarily a commercial cash enterprise that in the trees themselves. So windbreaks we've talked about. Um, and, you know, the, I'm gonna show a windbreak design example in a minute. And there's a whole other workshop that, there's a whole other workshop that I do on windbreak, kind of the details of windbreak design. Um, but really the thing to think about with windbreaks is kind of reconciling between what the kind of ideal windbreak would be from a windbreaking perspective. And then the fact that most of the time your farm landscape and layout will not allow you to kind of implement that ideal version. So, so there's often a kind of compromise with windbreaks between the two, and that can be reconciled sometimes by putting them to other uses, um, which we'll get into. So I just want to mention too this role of low vegetation breaks and prairie strips. Um, you know, this is one of the big kind of pesticide reduction tools, for instance, in, in non-organic systems is you just bring a big chunk of native biodiversity into the farm and it brings all the predator insects in with it. Um, so this is, and these then serve as big nutrient buffers also. So, um, you know, just remember that your, your buffers don't always just have to be trees. And sometimes, sometimes it's easier to implement something like this. Um, this is the alley cropping approach. This is the silvo arable kind of trees with row crops, trees with vegetables systems. These are really, these are surprisingly complex systems. And, you know, and it particularly has to do with um, the role of mechanized management and the role of equipment in these systems and also making sure you don't plant too many trees. A lot of people who have experimented with the alley cropping in cold climates, they end up saying, if I was going to do it again, I would plant half as many trees um, because of the management challenges that, that too many trees produces. Um, silvopasture alleys, right? So, um, so tree plantings that are primarily focused on shade and we'll give some gives an example of that in a minute. Silopasture plantings that are tree fodders, they're fodder banks for animals to either browse on directly or you're harvesting tree hay from them. Um, this is a black locust, this is a black locust fodder bank in New York here for goats. You know, this is a great multifunctional windbreak and silvopasture approach of outdoor living barns. So these are dense evergreen plantings that certain livestock have the cold tolerance to overwinter in rather than overwintering in a barn. Um, then the riparian and nutrient buffers themselves. And I'll give an example of that in, in some of our design examples too. Um, so here's, a, here's one design example. Um, okay, now I need to figure out moving, oops, mo moving my chat window here. That may not be possible. Let's see what I can do. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, so this is one of those examples where the ideal windbreak location was not actually possible because of other farm management. And so we had to improvise. So this is a, this is a site that gets huge northerly winds um, and you actually get snow drifting across parking lots and driveways. And so often a big goal of windbreaking is to address and also not unintentionally make worse snow drifting because you can actually make snow drifting worse by putting trees in the wrong in the wrong place. So in this case, we had a secondary snow break to the north that makes the snow drop first. So that, that area between phase 1A and phase two will fill up with snow and then the wind will be secondarily buffered by 
the phase 1A trees without so much snow in it. Um, so if you have a lot of snow drifting, you have to think like they do in places like Wyoming and Utah around snow fencing. Um, but just to give you the idea that the most effective windbreaks are multi-layer, they're wide, and they have diverse evergreens and the diverse evergreens and deciduous trees in them to be you know the most successful. Um, these are dense plantings. And so windbreaks are example where you want a lot of height, you want all the trees to survive, and you usually want it soon. And that's a tricky combination with it being affordable because planting bigger sized trees gets really expensive. So we often have a role of the fast growing hybrid um, willows and poplars in windbreaks because they're, the, they're some of the things that can produce the most height the fastest in this climate. Um, another little design example, um, just some images of silvopasture alley systems. So these, this is by far the most kind of uh, frequently successful approach to adding trees to pastures involves planting them in alleys rather than in a distributed, you know, evenly distributed fashion so that you can graze animals with movable fence between them. Um, so an 80 foot row spacing with, with 25 foot canopy trees looks like on the left, it's in the middle is a 60 foot row spacing, on the right is a 40 foot row spacing, and I would almost never go tighter than that. And usually I would actually be even more than 40 feet for um, especially for you know sheep and goats uh, early on. Again, this is a whole other topic, but just to give you some images of what some of the most successful approaches have looked like in, in most cases. Um, and then we have, here's a site that you know, we employed a few diverse strategies in. So there was an existing civil pasture planting, that's that white polygon on the left. Um, and, but not quite enough trees, so the animals were concentrating in the shade underneath them, and so the approach here was to add more trees, but added in alleys rather than dotted throughout. On the the blue, these this is a kind of forest kind of afforestation of a wet spring fed draw. So these were this was put in as a nutrient bank and and fodder bank for dry periods of the year when the wet ground dried up. Um, so this is a bunch of mulberries and willows for goats to browse on as a fodder bank. Um, and kind of extending that finger of the forest out. And then on the right here, this is a, um, this is a nutrient buffer for, a, um, for a, a winter loafing yard for cows. So here there's actually a, it's a bioswale. It's actually a basin that was then planted with willow and elderberry as a way of kind of rapidly developing a root system that could absorb some of that nutrient that would accumulate in the basin. So, you know, these are, these are three different practices. They were site, they were specific to this site and this multi-species grazing system. Um, but just to give you an example of kind of some of the functional work that trees and woody crops can end up doing in a bunch of different farms. Um, and so we're gonna just pause for the last few minutes here to see what questions and comments people had. That was a very, a very whirlwind tour. I just took you on, I know, and thanks for your good, your good patience and interest, but I would just love to hear for your situation, for your farm or your landscape, what are some of the ideas and especially some of the questions that this conversation is making you think about and want to learn more about? You want that in chat? Connor, yes, let's let's to unmute and talk to you. Uh, yeah, let's let's go with unmuting. Let's hear people's voices. Um, so jump in. I I'm gonna actually stop the share so I can see people's screens a little more. Hi, Connor. Um, it's Jess. Hey, Hi. Jess. Great. Um, thank you so much. This is super interesting. I was wondering. Um, and you may you may have mentioned it, and I missed it, <laughs> but I think for my property, hedgerows are what I'm looking at, um, and I know they're uh, double planted. What, what's your spacing um, recommendations for a hedgerow on like a smaller property? Sure. It all, the, it, there, there is not a single recommended spacing. It all depends on what you're trying to achieve with the hedgerow. So, um, so give, me, give me some of your kind of, um, kind of goals, and, goals and parameters as you understand them. Um, so I'm actually trying to build a um, perennial a uh, crop of different, um, I'm a flower farmer, so I'm- Aha, uh -huh, right, right. Ornamentals and um, stuff like that. While I would like to have my own personal fruit and nut trees, and yep. not ruling them out, but kind of just um, working with um, greens for the winter and also um, foliages that can be used in design. Totally, yeah. So this is this is a great example of a of one of the handful of industries that actually 
you know, there are actually productive hedgerow systems that produce a marketable crop in this region. So I'm glad you brought up, I'm glad you brought up woody florals and, and ornamentals. Um, so the, the key, the, the key to the design and layout of those systems is the accessibility for harvest. So you have to lay it out so that you can actually access and efficiently cut the, the, the woody product that you're gonna use. So generally for those that ends up, I, I agree a lot of those cases, a two row layout is ideal because then you can access it from both sides. Um, if they are a component of a windbreak, then you wanna leave a gap between the floral row and the windbreak so that you can walk between and, and access it. Um, and then the spacing between the trees is really just whatever is ideal for the type of product you're growing. So if you're growing stems, they can be much closer together because they'll act, that'll actually encourage stem growth. And if you're, however, if you're growing um, fruits, like fruiting branches, like with winterberry holly, you want them to be far enough apart that they can develop their full crown because that's what will maximize their fruiting. So it really just, it depends on the specific products you're growing. Thank you. Great. Someone else. Connor, do you have a, a list of um, shrubs and, and uh, other perennials for hedgerows? Um, there's no, there's so many and, but also, um, also there's just so many farm situations that call for different things. Um, but what I would say is that again, you wanna just figure out what the hedgerow is trying to do. So if you're if you want to if you want to have a hedgerow whose primary function is windbreaking, um, oh thanks Marjorie, Th thanks for thanks for coming in. Um, if your primary function is windbreaking, then you the big things you're generally needing to achieve are height and density and an evergreen component. So. Um, you want to, so you know the best species for the height are usually the hybrid poplars and willows, um, and you know and then there's some other things like you know white pine is decent with its height, but it's actually not a good long-term windbreak species because it drops all its lower branches, so you lose the windbreaking once it gets to a certain place. Um, for the density, it's really just about density of planting more than species. And then for the evergreen component, um, you know, that's a, that's a tricky one. And, you know, there are a handful of broadleaf evergreen species, but they don't get to a very big height, right? So we're talking about the rhododendrons, the azaleas, and the, um, the American holly, if you're far enough south that it can survive. So, um, and then slightly higher are kind of some of the native, um, native, uh, can, you know, cypress family and then spruce fir type evergreens. So usually I'd say balsam fir and white spruce are two of the best, I'll say balsam fir, white spruce, and then the Eastern juniper, the junipers virginiana are usually the, the best evergreens for windbreaks um, because they kind of marry some growth rate with a lot of density, even at larger sizes. Um, and then we have a question from Christine, silva pasture with sheep and goats. Um, yeah, so I would actually, let's see. Um, the big question there is, are you interested in trying to grow woody fodder for the animals or not? Or are you just trying to plant the trees for shade? Because if you're, um, and then it goes from there into a bunch of kind of detailed specifics of your site and how your grazing rotations currently work. So the biggest thing with the silvo pasture is that it has to work in your rotational system because they, they'll kill the trees if they have too much contact with them. So, um, and also you need to have minimal to no contact for the first year or two as the trees are first getting established. So it's really a grazing, it's kind of a grazing plant integration question. Um, and what terrain is ideal to start with? Well, with sheep and goats, not wet terrain because of all the parasites they get from wet ground. So that'd be where I'd start and not too steep that you're gonna get soil erosion from grazing. So, but anywhere in between is workable. Um, Jessica, I think has their hand raised again. Yeah, it's kind of stuck, but I actually do have another question. <laughs> <laughs> Great, go for it. Um, I was actually, um, I'm sure this is look upable, but um, could you just give a brief overview or like a, 101 guide to finding your prevailing winds and how and how to position your hedgerows. Yeah, so the I mean the you have to think about if it's summer or winter that you're primarily concerned about. Um, and so like for instance, if you're 
like especially with goats, if you're overwintering them in a barn, they're really temperature sensitive. So you really want to protect them from winter wind. Same with if you have an, av an apiary, a bee yard, there's a lot of bee mortality from winter cold. So, um, you know, and then if there's a snow drifting problem you're trying to solve, those are some of the more common like winter issues. Um, if it's a summer, if it's a summer wind, most of the region, in most of the region, prevailing winds in this region are, in, are from the Southwest, but that's not true on the coast. So if you're on the coast, you have really have to learn the local conditions. It's often a sea, it's often a sea wind. Um, the inland in at least central and Western mass is usually Southwesterly winds in the summer and Northwesterly winds in the winter. And then you can get storms from any direction. So that's a starting point, but you wanna really study where you are. Cause if you're in the Valley bottom, for instance, in like along the Connecticut river, you'll get some localized effects from Mount Toby and, and the you know, Mount Tom range and stuff like that. And you'll also get some just effects from the Valley itself. Um, hedgerow to control erosion on a hillside from Elizabeth. Yeah, so there's, this really depends on how bad the erosion is and how steep the hillside is. So um, there are some situations where, I mean, it, maybe you can even tell me what your parameters are because it's just so different. It's just so different with different variables. Um, what's, some, what's some of your parameters, Elizabeth? Like what percent slope are we talking about in, and uh, what is it currently being used for? Is it, is it grazed? Elizabeth, can you unmute and ask that question? Answer Connor's question. Um, I'm not sure, um, maybe a 30% slope. Oh, wow. And <laughs> an area that was, <clears throat> um, um was was chopped up by um some construction mm, interesting so it's not being farmed yeah i'd have to see it my guess is that you actually don't want to jump i mean i it it's so hard to say without seeing it um but there might be a role for there might be a role for fast growing woody species. There might be a role for some limited earthworks in that situation. Actually, like doing a very small bioretention basin um, to kind of stop erosion at the point. And there might be a role for kind of cover cropping, kind of fast growing annuals to hold the ground. Um, Maureen, yeah, good question. More than I can answer right now. Um, but kind of it's a it is kind of a holistic decision making question there that depends on your overall your overall thing and happy to chat more if you want to email me um so okay i am being told to wrap it up and i'm happy to do that but i just want to put my email address in the chat if anyone wants to write me i'm glad to be in touch um and this was a great pleasure thanks for your thanks for your good attention and interest in all this